the flows of energy and mass in and out of each commons, or, in fact, between them, make it physically impossible for a commons to be a self-sufficient closed system. In the life domain, commons are deeply intertwined and radically entangled with one another. This means that every commons cannot function properly as a commons if its connection in the network of interdependent commons is disrupted or if the other associated commons are decommonized. Human creative power as a commons is interdependent and intertwined with other commons in the life domain. Under capitalism, social norms, historical traditions, and ecological contexts shape human creativity and innovation. However, capitalist production relations disrupt and also sever these cross-commons entanglements. Human creativity's causal power as a source of value is undermined and perverted to a mere means of production and profit. The causal power of an object is intrinsic to its structure, and therefore, with a change in the object's structure, the nature of its causal power also changes. The structure of concrete creative power as a commons, which is its concreteness, is its material cause. This gives it the causal power to function as an autonomous efficient cause of true value independent of capitalist relations. Under capital's rule, labor is reified primarily, leading to a change in its structure, and its causal power as a potential efficient cause of value, in the form of work transforms into a material cause in the process of commodity production, material or immaterial. This material cause can be directly exploited as the so-called productive labor, turned into a substance of value, or be expropriated as the so-called non-productive labor, a gift of, human, nature from which value is extracted. Labor is the product of the decommunization of human creativity and its alienation from its original commoning nature, which continues in the capitalist commodity production process through the secondary abstraction process, theorized by Marx. What defines labor as labor, productive or unproductive from capital's point of view, is the primary abstraction process. The unique ability of labor to produce value added cannot be its only defining feature. Marx explains that even outside capitalist relations, surplus work, is normally needed. For Marx, the imagined post-capitalist association of free and equal producers who own the means of production in common and expend their many different forms of labor power in full self-awareness would still need to conduct surplus labor to maintain and upgrade their means of production and to meet the various needs of the society where the association comes from and the association's own needs as a communal being. See Marx, 1990, pages 171 to 172. Private exchange no longer determines the value, and thus, no fetishization of commodities happens. Hence, in this situation, according to Marx, the social relations of producers will be simple and transparent in all moments. Marx assumes, only for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the labor time necessary to produce use value would still need to be employed to determine the contribution of each worker and to finally apportion through social planning, the right magnitudes of appropriate labor functionalities to produce for the satisfaction of various collective needs. The Roots of Alienation – The Loss of Commoning Origin and Nature In the world of contingencies, every cause has a cause. Labor as a cause of value is also caused. Once again, from the Aristotelian perspective of causality, labor must have four types of causes, all subject to decommunization under capitalism. In other words, labor, to be possessed by capital, has to be, dispossessed, of its causal structure. For this to happen, capital, through the secondary abstraction process, has to decommunize the four constituting elements of labor. 1. Its material cause, which is its concreteness. 2. Its efficient cause, which is its life activity or what reproduces labor. 3. Its formal cause, or the communal cohesion and solidarity among the value producers, and, 4. Its final cause, which is its function to prefiguratively fulfill needs, create meaningful and gratifying living experiences, and advance collective well-living. These four types of appropriation of the commoning features of labor, respectively, correspond to the four types of alienation of laboring individuals that Marx specifically theorized. Alienation is the estrangement of workers, 
1. From their own essential species being. 2. From their life activity. 3. From one another. And 4. From the product of their labor. By understanding the correspondence between the four types of alienation and the four Aristotelian causes of labor, we can see how the process of decommunization under capitalism has resulted in the fragmentation and subjugation of labor as a common resource. The dehumanizing effects of capitalism can be seen in the way that workers are reduced to mere instruments of production, and their labor is stripped of its communal, creative, and prefigurative potential. The efficient cause of labor is the life-making work of oikos that, under capital is perverted into unwaged social reproductive labor. However, unlike productive labor, reproductive work is not directly capitalized through secondary abstraction. Rather, it is only primarily abstracted and expropriated alongside the rest of nature. This way, like unpaid surplus wage labor, unwaged social reproductive labor loses its creative subjectivity and becomes a material cause for the reproduction of so-called productive labor, instead of being an efficient cause alongside creative work in the commoning process of true value production. The unwaged reproductive laborer receives a portion of the wage, assuming the household relations are fair, won by the breadwinner in exchange for their contribution to the reproduction of labor and, by extension, of fetish value, and this way, it becomes reified, deprived of their subjectivity, but not commodified, unless waged directly by working, for example as a care worker. The material cause of labor is its concreteness, its natural bodily and mental power for creativity and the socially produced embedded skills and knowledge, which are the byproducts of the metabolic interaction with the rest of nature through social reproduction. The alienation of labor from the rest of nature turns labor into a mere tool, a biological machine, alienated from its life activity. Care, when exercised in non-alienating relations among value producers, is the backbone of conviviality, which is the formal cause of true value in the commonest social formation. However, with the decommunization of convivial sources of true value, care is reduced to a range of institutionalized qualities, from the so-called positive culture of collegiality to compassionate leadership to staff well-being programs and a whole range of performative gestures of corporate social responsibility. Only simulated care that masks the exploitation inherent in the capitalist mode of production, perpetuating the illusion of a compassionate work environment while preserving the power dynamics and inequalities that underpin it. Counter-management comradeship and solidarity among worker union members, where there is no agenda to restore the commoning nature of care and conviviality, appear as part of a counter-movement to the social disembeddedness of the economy. However, without a transformative vision that challenges the underlying power structures and aims to reinstate genuine care and conviviality, such initiatives can only provide temporary relief within the confines of the existing capitalist framework. The communal settings of value producers outside their workplaces, as another aspect of the commoning formal cause of their labor, also need to change for the causal structure of labor to change, from efficient cause to material cause of fetish value. The conviviality of communal support that gives workers their communal existence turns into social relations between commodities produced by labor, mediated by the market, and governed by the exogenous forces of politics, thus losing its convivial essence. Labor, therefore, loses its convivial solidarity base and becomes socially alienated from its internal and broader communities. The reification of human relations under capital has to be complemented with commodity money relations fetishized as a pseudo community, thus giving a false sense of living in a commons built around self seeking or hedonistic relationships between the participants. The final cause in the employment of human creative power is originally its prefigurative function to transcend the status quo and achieve a higher level of communal well living and self thriving through alterity. However, it has been replaced with the regeneration of capitalist and fetish value, which is commodified or contained in the products of labor. This results in the alienation of producers from the outcomes of their activities. The problem of alienation within production relations is not rooted in the replacement or subjugation of use value by exchange value but rather in their contradictory duality. 
Alienation extends beyond commodity production relations and begins when human creativity through primary abstraction that perverts it into labor loses its capacity to function as an efficient commoning source of true value. Capital as an object gains subjectivity and the status of an active self-energizing final cause. Therefore, not only commodity exchanges guided by social value complexes abstract human creativity, by inverting its subjective and objective aspects, but also the decommonized sources of alterity, such as the capitalist legal, political, and cultural regimes, determine the terms of exchange and regulations, as the formal cause granting capital and autocratic control over the entire process. The laborers become alienated not only from their labor, products and processes of production, but also from their convivial life, solidarity with other laborers and their own broader communities, from the rest of nature, and from their collective self-determining power, as an open-ended final cause. Alienation should, therefore, not be seen simply as a side effect of capitalist production relations but also as an imperative factor in the entire capitalization process rooted in the decommunization of the life domain. To liberate labor, it is far from adequate to merely struggle to restore its capacity for healthy self-reproduction as labor. Granting laborers ownership of the means of production does not restore the concreteness of their creative power if the realization of the value they produce is still subject to private exchanges. Even if the buyers and sellers of labor power are the same groups of producers, their labor is still subject to abstraction and commodification, i.e., capitalism without capitalists. The true liberation of laborers will require commonizing their labor back into more than human creativity which itself requires, re, commonizing their material, efficient, formal, and final causes of existence. In other words, labor can achieve its full commoning status only when the broader context in which production processes function is also commonized. This includes political institutions, community relations, ownership, cultural complexes, labor and commodity markets, and more. See the next section. Disentangling our lives from both state and market by creating autonomous spaces of commoning does not necessarily lead to the full realization of the commonest state of being unless the state and the market, as well as their underpinning value systems, are profoundly reshaped in the image of commons. See Note 7. The concept of commons should be expanded beyond its traditional scope to include also the complex web of social, economic, and political relations within and between markets states, and their entangled ecological and cultural systems, see Hosseini and Gills, 2022. Azzolini's study of worker recuperated companies, WRCs, in Latin America reveals their strengths and their limitations. Self-organizing communities are built, new values and norms based on solidarity and conviviality emerge and the metabolic relationship with the sources of livability may positively change as the purpose of production shifts more toward the reproduction of what is essential for the communal life. The results radiate beyond the contours of such commoning praxis with potentially strong implications for the community economy and even for wider politics. However, their linkages with the capitalist state and market continue to be unproductive at best, and the disintegration between production and reproduction activities remains almost the same. Such examples, at most, more closely resemble common source pool institutions that are the center of new institutionalist attention than the necessary means of a social revolution. See Endnote 8. For the latter to happen, a paradigmatic shift is required. A communist theory of value must be very attentive to the relationships between commons and capital, see De Angelis, 2022, page 651. The unheeded primary abstraction. The communist theory of value requires us to differentiate between primary and secondary abstractions of labor. As defined earlier, abstraction is the inversion between the subject and the object, i.e., reification complemented with fetishization. In this sense, both primary and secondary types of abstraction have the same essence. However, it is their location that makes them different. Marx theorized the, secondary, abstraction, of commodified, wage labor, within, through the inner organization of capital. 
primary abstraction, see figures 4.1 and 5.1, consists of the reification and fetishization of the fundamental commons, in this case, the more than human, commoning sources of creativity. Primary abstraction is independent of capitalist formats, the industrial versus the post-industrial, the Fordist versus the post-Fordist, etc. It is what labor, commodified or not, is born out of. In fact, primary abstraction has become more prominent in the late capitalism of advanced economies since capital has constantly developed effective ways of extracting fetish value out of uncommodified yet reified work such as care, social, and ecological services. But for concrete labor to be subsumed into abstract labor, which is no longer capable of producing true value, and for commodities to become the bearer of exchange value, which can be converted into prices, specific social relationships must have already emerged and been sustained as preconditions for the constant re-emergence of labor. This specific form of production relations is characterized by the separation of the objective conditions of production, means of production, and the subjective conditions, labor power. This separation results in the bifurcation of labor itself, concrete and abstract, and the bifurcation of value. This separation is both the product and the producer of a decommonized society, in Marx's narrower term, the commodity society, which transcends the inner organization of capital and underpins its persistence. It is a society in which the fundamental sources of creativity, livability, conviviality, and alterity are constantly perverted into abstract labor, objectified nature, alienating hierarchical relations, and self-fossilizing political cultures, respectively. For Marx, abstract labor is the substance, or material cause, of capitalist value. The more labor is, secondarily, abstracted, the more capitalist value is produced. Such abstraction, for Marx, is determined by the social average of labor time necessary for production, which is outside the worker's control. Abstraction makes the quantification of labor power, and thus its exchange, possible. However, a deeper investigation of the complexity of Marx's value theory paves the way to addressing its constraints using his own method. According to Marx, the abstraction of labor depends on the exchange of the products of labor, which in one cycle happens after labor is already employed. Exchange is, therefore, a formal cause of abstraction. But how can exchange play such a role as a determinant of value? Exchange, inclusive of the exchanges of labor as a commodity, has a tacit political dimension since it is influenced by power relations, flows of information, and wealth distributions that constantly change. Hence, it constantly requires the actors involved to draw on their prefigurative capacities to speculate on the fluctuations in demands, supplies, costs, and prices, with ever imperfect market information. The secondary abstraction of labor via commodity exchanges is dependent on and deeply intertwined with the perversion of communal interdependences and actors' deliberative power to prefigure their communal futures into market relations and self-centered speculative actions in pursuit of profit. Final causes operate through evolutionary processes, allowing them to influence the inputs of following circuits despite being the outputs of a previous causal process, giving the appearance of a teleological effect. In the case of social causal mechanisms in open systems, primitive bearers of the final cause coexist with and guide the other three fundamental causes from the outset of the process. These primitive bearers can emerge as cognitive affective prefigurative tendencies, such as the desires, imaginations, and ideals of actors, as well as pre-established social institutions, like the so-called free markets and the state, which regulate social relations. As Marx theorized, in a society dominated by industrial capital, capitalist, value, as a representation of socially necessary abstract labor time, imposes its finality and constraints on society as a whole, refer to Aulet, 2015, page 22. Competitive private exchange serves a much deeper function beyond abstracting labor and making commodities, including labor, commensurable. It is a constantly recurring meta-mechanism that reshapes the values, desires, wants, and needs of actors, 
as well as their social institutional manifestations, in the image of the ultimate form of the final cause, capital. As a result, a secondary inversion of the subject and object occurs. Marx later modified his view by considering exchange value as a mere form of expression of value as the content, and by clarifying that commodity is both a use value and value, rather than use value and exchange value as opposites. It is possible to produce use value and value without producing commodities. To produce a commodity, the use value should be produced for others outside the proximate community of producers, i.e., social use value, rather than for the community of producers, who may also exchange their products across their communities. Marx addresses primary abstraction by discussing the conversion from primitive modes of production to the capitalist mode of production through which the communal character of general labor is lost to the fetishized exchange of commodities. For Marx, in primitive production, the social character of the use value of common products lies in their communal character, rather than in their communal exchanges. For products to enter the world of commodities, they need to be produced under an economic formation through which the value of products assumes a form of expression distinct, independent from its natural form contained in the commodity. Thus, the unity of value and use value becomes a duality that translates itself into the dual character of labor, i.e., the useful, concrete form that produces use value and the abstract form as the expenditure of labor power. Marx distinguishes between labor and labor power. In contrast to a slave society where masters own and control both the worker's body and capacity to work, i.e., the substantial and the efficient constituents of labor, in capitalism, it is only the capacity to work, i.e., labor power, that is being bought and sold as a commodity. The workers' bodies and the substance of their labor, and thus their subjectivity, remain free from full submission and objectification, unlike in slavery or serfdom, see Hudis, 2019. The abstraction and commodification of labor is only a change in the form of labor power rather than in its content substance. The bifurcation between labor and labor power constitutes a potential for resistance. Under capital, and unlike abstract labor which functions as a material cause, concrete labor remains the mover and the efficient cause of value production, even if its role is systematically denied by capital through the laws of private exchange. The essence of labor, human creativity, remains a potential common subject to constant decommonization, but also a potential source for the emergence of progressive alternatives to capital. However, the actualization of this potentiality is contingent upon a negation at a deeper level, which is the negation of the infra-processes through which labor is constructed out of the decommonization of human creativity. The abolition of productive capitalist value, by negating the exchange value, which is only an alienated expression of value, requires the abolition of the, secondarily, abstracted labor that is the substance of capitalist value. However, it would be a mistake to assume that the emancipation of labor and thus the working class ends here. Using the communist value theory, we must extend this logic by acknowledging that the abolition of abstract labor is impractical as long as we still have an infra-process in place through which labor is primarily abstracted out of commoning sources of creativity. Labor, insofar as it functions as a material bearer of exchange value, cannot be organized as a commoning praxis, see Azzolini, 2016, page 766. Therefore, the full and meaningful liberation of laborers happens when the primary abstraction of labor is abolished, and labor as productive work is returned to its commoning status as part of a wider, more than human capacity for creativity. The secondary abstraction of labor within the inner organization of capital through the competitive private exchange, as theorized by Marx, is not possible without decommonizing the communal bonds between, more than human, producers of true value and the conversion into alienating commodity exchanges. The secondary abstraction is, in fact, the alteration of the formal aspect of the causal structure of labor, via the replacement of communal relations with private exchange, and thus is the further extension of primary abstraction into the inner organization of commodity production. 
private exchange, is the perverted or decommonized version of convivial relations that functions as a formal cause by giving structure to the realization of the fetish value through the secondary abstraction of labor. As Marx explains, exchange is a form of the socialization of labor. However, not every socialization of labor is part of its abstraction. For instance, labor was socialized but not abstracted in feudal society where the means of production were commonly shared. Secondary abstraction of labor becomes possible when this socialization happens through the means of private exchanges of the products of wage labor. Capital abstracts labor by perverting it from a potentially efficient and active cause of use value into a material cause. The purpose is to turn labor into the bearer of its final cause, capitalist fetish value. This is possible through a mixture of privatized exchange structures and state intrusions that function as the formal cause of capitalist value. It happens when conviviality in a communist state of sociality has already been, to an adequate degree, perverted into a commodity society, that forms the social basis of exchange and thus functions as a formal cause of fetish value. A society dispossessed of its conviviality is deeply prone to the reconstruction of patriarchal and racial relations in modern forms. Capital, in fact, cannot function effectively in the presence of communist conviviality. For capital to function as the final cause of the abstraction of labor, it needs to concurrently transmute, pervert other fundamental commoning sources of true value, i.e., sources of conviviality, care, livability, and alterity. Capital can never be indifferent to inequalities outside the realm of its so-called productive relations. The social substance of human creativity, work, is perverted into abstract labor deprived of agency and its potentiality for creating true value. It becomes a material cause of fetish value by being contained in commodities. As Engels emphasizes in his Anti During, 1947, Part 2, Chapter 6, Marx was the first to demonstrate that, under capital labor can have no value, since capitalist value itself is nothing else than the expression of socially necessary human labor materialized in an object. However, a communist perspective builds upon this postulate by highlighting that labor, in its participation within the capitalist system, becomes a tool of capital and contributes to the ongoing process of decommonizing the four fundamental sources of true value. The private exchange under capital is also an abstracted, reified plus fetishized, form of relationship with the natural resources, necessary for the production and reproduction of commodities, capital, and labor. Exchange, therefore, determines not only the abstraction of labor but also the abstraction of the so-called natural resources, by perverting the fundamental sources of livability into reified entities whose prices are determined in markets. The conviviality of more than human reproductive relations is perverted into private exchange relations deprived of morality, empathy, and diversity to function as a formal cause and the sources of livability are perverted, objectified into the so-called natural resources, nature's free gifts, deprived of their intrinsic values and their subjectivities that enable them to regenerate and sustain themselves. Finally, the prefigurative power of humanity for alterity is converted to instrumentalist behaviors conservative enough to endure the will, power of capital. What is happening here is not simply an extraction of surplus value out of surplus labor but rather the conversion of true value, as a real potentiality, to fetish value, as a faked actuality, by simultaneously perverting all the four fundamental commons of organized life. Secondary abstraction. The primary abstraction by other means. A deeper understanding of Marx's method reveals that, real, abstraction involves the inversion of subjective and objective aspects of a fundamental cause of value, such as human creativity. This is made possible through the fusion of two opposite mechanisms, reification and fetishization, which complement each other. Reification involves the conversion of a social subject or subjective aspect of a socio-ecological entity such as private labor according to Marx and capital, into an object, such as variable commodity capital. When employed at surplus levels, this can produce surplus value, which is the origin of profit. 
Despite the complexities of the transformation problem, a labor theory of value, LTV, can still explain quantitative exploitation. In contrast, fetishization is a process where an object, such as a product of labor, is given the status of a subject, such as commodities with the agency to determine the value of labor through a private exchange. Here, Marx's theory offers a value theory of labor, VTL, which was lacking in the works of his predecessors, C. Elson, 1979. The two processes of reification and fetishization complement each other to bifurcate work into abstract and concrete labor. The subjectivity derived from concrete labor is assigned to its products, including the profit that is reinvested in production to reproduce capital, by giving them a determining power over X subjects, concrete labor, through exchange relations, realization of value in the commodity market and the re-employment of labor as a commodity in the labor market. Real abstraction is thus an inversion of the subjective and objective aspects of a common resource, which results in its perversion from a source of true value to a source of fetish value. This construction of the Marxian idea of real abstraction provides a broader analytical framework that is equally applicable to all other types of causal sources of true value. Under a capitalist social formation, capital seizes the subjectivity and evaluative power of more than human agents of creativity, reducing their efficient causality in value production to a mere material cause devoid of communal prefigurative power. See Endnote 9. More consciously and conscientiously than other species, humans have the capacity to use their evaluative subjective power to envision a future and prefiguratively translate their perceptions of good life, as the final cause, into their practices of true value creation. Under capital, however, their evaluative power and thus their efficient causal functions are reduced to their roles as self-centered atomized beings who have internalized the well-being of capital as their own. This feature of capital creates a hyper-reality in contradiction with the reality of life since what underpins life as a commons is fundamentally different from the living conditions forged by capital. See Endnote 10. The focus of the communist value theory is not merely the transformation of value into price or any other value form of labor products or the correspondence between them. See Endnote 11. Instead, it should be the perversion of the commoning sources of creativity into mere instruments for capitalist fetish value production. This perversion turns human creativity into a reified object, i.e., labor, with its dual functionality, concrete and abstract, emerging from commodity production and private exchange and being appropriated by capital in the money form of value. The perversion of human creativity is indeed a transmutation, transition in essence, rather than a transformation, transition in form, quiddity, appearance, expression. What matters most is not the transformation of one value form to another but the substantial rift between the types of value that essentialize human creativity free from capital, as opposed to its perverted version, i.e., labor, under capital. After the perversion, capital can extract what it claims to be of value, by fetishizing it as, one, an allegedly naturally occurring utility worth exchanging at a certain market price, which is another perverted commons, i.e., the otherwise convivial communal interactions reconstructed in the form of private exchanges, supposedly promoting the well-being of consumer society whose needs, values, desires, and wants are altered to play roles in realizing capital's final cause. 2. A legitimate necessity for the social conditions of the possibility of labor, by virtue of the use value embodied in the means of subsistence. 3. A fetishized right crystallized in the form of wage, that purports to represent the value of work expended, and finally. 4 a means to meet the imperatives of capital's reproduction, reinvestment in variable and constant capital, necessary for sustaining the whole system, into which labor, as capital's other, is co-opted. Marx in Capital is well aware of perversion but does not expand the scope of his value theory to include it, for the reasons we explained earlier. It is true that the complexity of his value theory has been largely overshadowed by the dominance of the interpretations that consider his work as an extension of the classical legacies, i.e., 
The Labor Theory of Value, C. Riva, 2022. The point of departure in the analysis of labor should be shifted to the normative communist state of living, where human labor exists in the form of its unreified essence. This is not contrary to Marx's method. As Dobb, 1972, argued in his interpretation of capital, the starting point for Marx, contra the conventional interpretations, is not the commensurability of commodities due to their contained abstract labor. Rather, Marx starts from before the doubling of the product of labor happens, where the turning of objects of utility, i.e., natural and social forms of wealth, into commodities becomes possible through the private and autonomous processes of valorization. See Riva, 2022. The reification of human creativity into labor power, and then its further reification into abstract labor, has to be complemented by its fetishization for the secondary abstraction to become complete. Wage labor is fetishized and sanctified in the name of work, as the only way for the majority to meet their needs and reclaim their dignity. See Gores, 1999. From family values to school curriculums, from welfare policies to social security, public health care, and social work, and from prison systems to military services, all are mobilized to create work-ready subjects. See Weeks, 2011, pp. 6 to 7. This requires social institutions to be restructured away from their commoning nature through their modernization. Their institutionalization under modernity is the infra process through which they become the apparatus for the decommunization of creative power and the bearers of the mechanisms for civilizing capital. Only a fetishized form of value, extracted out of a reified commons, i.e., more than human creative power, can be translated into prices and profits, as they are now of the same essence. Thus, in this alienating environment, the owners, sellers of labor as a commodity internalize the imperatives of living under capital. According to these imperatives, one, their prefigurative struggles should aim at gaining parity with capital and thus reducing their relative otherness and, two, treating the impedimental consequences of capitalist production for the survival of the subaltern other, such as non-human living beings, reproductive labor, marginalized communities, the indigenous, the immigrant, the colonized, the racialized, and the like, as externalities, improves living standards by making the social reproduction of both labor and capital more economically viable. The magnitude of the value of labor congealed as socially necessary labor time, as determined by commodities in private exchange processes. Abstraction of labor in capital is the byproduct of the unity of production and circulation. The valorization process, extraction of value out of labor, ultimately yields no value from capital's point of view if the realization processes fail. If there is no utility in the commodity made for others, there will be no value, and therefore, the employed labor does not count as productive. But what defines and determines utility? Indeed, commodities material and immaterial, are not merely produced for the sake of being exchanged. Although exchange value subsumes use value, the latter remains critical. Use value is not simply the physical qualities of the products of labor, see Bellofiori, 2018. It is more importantly shaped by the consumerist society's socio-ideologically manufactured perceptions of utility, influenced by social preferences. These are themselves the societal manifestations of culturally constructed wants, desires, values, and needs of the populace. The so-called superstructure, here the societal interactions that construct preferences, plays a decisive role in the production of value in the base. The superstructure, as part of the formal cause, becomes an inducer of fetish value, the final cause, in the abstraction of proletarianized labor. The value, want, desire, need complexes of a society under a communist state of living, i.e., webs of daily socio-ecological interactions guided by convivial norms and values, oriented toward a communal imagination of a more-than-human good life, are fundamental social commons by nature that provide human creativity with the formal causes it needs to generate true value as the essence of the good life, i.e., its final cause. If these causal sources of conviviality could maintain their commoning nature, 
as an association of free actors living in a communist state of being, the quantity, quality, utility, and worth of the products would be decided freely to favor the well-living of the given more than human community, rather than to satisfy the private profit motive. Therefore, capital depends on decommonizing the commoning sources of alterity into modern state and political institutions that idealize and rationalize, mainly, those, innovative, actions that are oriented toward the endless accumulation of capitalist value. In sum, after applying the above reconstructed Marxian logic to a scope broader than the inner dynamism of productive labor, we can infer that the secondary abstraction of labor power is not only made possible, by but also is the extension of, primary abstraction infra-process through which human creativity, as an efficient, fundamental cause of true value, is transmuted into a reified fetishized appropriated, de-essentialized object called, labor, deprived of its organic connections with the other three fundamental commons. Labor is born out of such a primary abstraction, reification plus fetishization, of human creativity, a decommonizing infra-process, and thus is ready to be translated into a commodity form, that commodity value that can be extracted and appropriated by capital. What Marx calls, abstract labor, captures this process only within the inner structure of capital where human creativity is already perverted into labor. For Marx, abstract labor as a process of value creation as the result of making diverse concrete labor commensurable under the disciplinary force of competition, Blackledge 2015. But, even within this limited realm of productive capital, it is not simply the proportionality of the rate of exploitation and rate of surplus value extraction, assuming that proportionality can finally be substantiated in the terrain of mathematical discourse, that discloses the nature of exploitation, see Bellofiori and Coveri, 2022. Marx and Capital attributes the qualitative aspect, nature, of exploitation to the essential change in labor vis-a-vis -vis capital. Abstraction and exploitation become virtually co-extensive. At the stage of the real subsumption of labor to capital, 2022, page 184, emphasis from original. Labor is primarily a product of primary abstraction, subject to further de-essentialization under secondary abstraction when directly engaged in commodity production. However, labor does not necessarily need to go through the secondary abstraction process to become the provider of the substance of fetish value, see figure 5.1. Abstract labor is not simply deconcretized or deskilled labor but rather a derivative form of work devoid of content and creativity. It emerged in a communal context with minimal conviviality and solidarity and represents the exchange value of labor power of laborers dispossessed of their autonomous agency to sustain their lives as part of the life domain and to determine their own fate prefiguratively. In those production relations where the involved, reproductive, labor is not directly commodified as wage labor, even if no value added is produced, the fetish value continues to grow as an augmented deficit caused by the demolition of the commoning basis of, more than, human creative work. Labor detained in the mechanical structure of capital. As posited earlier, Capital first reifies human creativity into labor power through the decommonization infra process, i.e., primary abstraction and primary appropriation, and then into abstract labor, which is contained in both material and immaterial commodities, through valorization and realization processes. For this to occur, capital must first enclose the material commoning sources of more than human livability, displace convivial relationships, and politically subjugate the emerging classes of workers in order to weaken their prefigurative power for alterity. This is because all four causal elements of labor are rooted in the four commoning sources of true value, see figure 5.2. Materially, labor cannot exist without relying on the livable sources of the life domain. For labor to become decommonized, these sources must also be decommonized. The early historical manifestation of this process in the case of England, the usurpation of common lands, expropriation of agricultural populations from the land, and creation of rightless laborers, and a home market for industrial capital, was explicitly discussed by Marx in the final part of Capital, Volume 1. 
depriving the agents of the creative power of their natural integration with the sources of livability makes them dependent on capital for their survival and biosocial reproduction. It is, therefore, essential for capital to enclose the material causes of livability, not just to extract their natural riches but also to make the primary abstraction and appropriation of creative power possible. Sources of livability alongside the convivial sources of life making are then peripheralized as the so-called conditions of possibility for the reproduction of labor. According to Marx, this should always chronologically precede capitalist accumulation, an accumulation which is not the result of the capitalist mode of production but its point of departure from Marx, 1990, page 873. Figure 5.2 depicts the causal structure of labor as decommonized creative power and its rootedness in the four commoning causes of true value. David Harvey, 2004, famously theorized the reinvention of this process in all possible new forms, such as neoliberal structural adjustments and austerity regimes, under the title of, Accumulation by Dispossession. Capital has been inherently dependent on dispossessing commons, as common resources, for constant accumulation, see Harvey 2003. From the communist framework point of view, dispossession, like the enclosure of the common lands and natural commons, only partly represents the appropriation process, as defined in the previous chapter. Marx and Harvey concentrate on the objective manifestation of a much deeper process which we may call accumulation by decommunization. Labor, natural resources as commodities such as land, reproductive work from household to the public sector to the market relations, and the political organization of modern society from corporatized workplaces to international politics are the reified fetishized products of the decommonizing infra-processes of the four causes of true value. They are respectively located in the manipulative, exploitative, extractivist, and domineering, mead, power structures of capital, cf. Figure 4.3. Their production happens outside the capitalist mode of production, as Marx claims, through what we may call the capitalist mode of decommonization. Capital is inherently dependent on decommonization, that is the perversion of the commoning nature of the fundamental sources of value. And, as argued previously, all four arenas of decommonization are essentially interdependent. Figure 4.3. One cannot happen without the others also happening, and conversely, one cannot be reversed, liberated without the others also being reversed, liberated. According to Marx, being disconnected from the rest of nature and incorporated into the mazes of capital laborers' communal senses of interconnectedness are replaced with capitalist social relations mediated by their products, material or immaterial, and the social forms of fetish value like money wage. The incorporation of oikos into capitalist relations reifies it into what is known as the economy. This process is more than just a discursive construction in bourgeois economics, and therefore, cannot be negated by merely changing our economic thoughts. Under capitalism, the commoning causes of conviviality and creativity lose their organic connections with one another. The dislocation of working people from their natural communities and habitats, oikoses, significantly weakens their conviviality, i.e., their ability to live in communal solidarity with each other and non-human beings while negotiating their differences. Capital encloses and reifies the commoning sources of conviviality to generate fetish value. The process is incomplete without the abstraction and appropriation of the commoning sources of alterity, i.e., the potentialities for prefigurative imagination and autonomous future-oriented decision-making, morally conscientious of the needs and rights of the transcendental and immanent other i.e. all living and even non-living beings inclusive of future generations the so-called productive laborers give up their willpower and real autonomy and hand over their imaginative power to capital which politically disincentivizes them dreams of individual accomplishment and desires to contribute to the common good become firmly attached to waged work where they can be hijacked to rather different ends. 
The wage relation generates not just income and capital, but disciplined individuals, governable subjects, worthy citizens, and responsible family members. C. Weeks, 2011, page 8. While the politics of labor and class struggles remain relevant, they primarily revolve around distributive conflicts concerning the allocation of labor's share within the capitalist value produced. Capital, in Nancy Fraser's terms, 2022, devours, not only the commodified labor, through exploitation, but also the uncommodifiable, unquantifiable, and socialized sources of value such as the planet, care, public infrastructure, social and digital commons, democratic institutions, communal activities, and the peripheralized other, through expropriation. As Fraser argues, expropriation is not limited to the historical primitive accumulation by enclosure in the early stage of the rise of capitalism in Europe. Rather, it is an ongoing development, a hidden abode behind Marx's hidden abode, that makes the exploitation of labor possible. See Endnote 12. The double hidden abode functions as the background conditions of possibility for capital's inner organization. See Fraser, 2014, page 57. The contemporary global expansion of resource frontiers and sacrifice zones in both global north and south exemplify this. New literature analyzing forms of global extractivism as rapidly emerging to address this global process. Entailing an ecocide genocide nexus, see Chagnon et al., 2022. The four elements of the so called productive capital's inner exploitative structure, according to Marx and listed by Fraser, 2022, consist of so called free labor, an efficient cause only in its concrete form, private ownership of the means of production, as the material cause, market as the formal cause, and capital's inherent imperative for self-expansion, as the final cause. However, the entire exploitative structure of capital should be seen as an infra-process through which, more than, human creative power is reduced only to a bearer of capital's final cause behind the production of fetish value, alongside the decommunization of the other three fundamental spheres of organized life, as described in the previous chapters. This perspective helps us explore a much more delicate and deeper working of capitality. One can concur with Fraser that, expropriation, confiscating others' assets, human and non-human, is an essential enabling condition for exploitation, in the form of surplus labor, by underlying it and making it more profitable. Marx was acutely aware of this relationship and did not overlook its significance. It is also critical to emphasize that the exploitation of labor and the entire political economic system that relies on it also creates the conditions of the possibility for the expropriation of the more than human subalterns, resulting in a two way relationship. At the core of this dialectical interplay between exploitation and expropriation lies the process of decommunization. Marxist feminists and social reproduction theorists have long been making efforts to highlight the fact that issues like domestic violence and the double exploitation of life-making workers, waged and unwaged, are made possible in more sophisticated ways than ever in the context of the commodification and exploitation of laborers, many of whom are females, see Mize, 1986. Austerity regimes in the Global North and structural adjustment programs in the Global South have contributed to the underfunding of social reproductive services, including the protection of victims of domestic and racial violence, the privatization of public assets, and the corporatization of the public sector. These have resulted in less affordable living expenses, higher household debts, which feed back into capital the semi-proletarianization of households, and the disappearance of the subsistence economy, causing mass dislocation of local natives, small self-sustaining, organic, and regenerative food production system, and more, see Bhattacharya, 2017. All this has become possible in the context where the perversion of the commoning sources of creativity fuels the relentless expansion of capital. Capital incorporates alienated labor, alienated from the moral fabric of living in commons, into its expropriation projects. Laborers, especially in the global core and the core islands of the global periphery, are beneficiaries of such mass looting, 
as social reproduction becomes more affordable for them, despite their stagnated wages and unstoppable household debt burden, thanks to the expropriation processes. The closer they are to the cores of the global north and south, the more they benefit. A significant portion of their wages is reinvested in the consumerist economy and finance capital markets, perpetuating and sustaining the processes of expropriation. The simple adoption of ethical consumption and boycotts, if they grow big enough and for a long period, may have some civilizing impacts on the capitalist expropriation process, but ironically, may contribute to the increase in the costs of living, which is why they usually lose steam quickly. The reification and appropriation of, more than, human creative power in capitalist production relations helps capital to reify sources of more than human livability since labor's alienation from nature strips nature of its powerful, conscientious agency against capital. The alienation of labor turns it into capital's proxy making labor a condition of possibility for the direct extraction of value from sources of livability, conviviality, and alterity. Here, the annexation of one indispensable source of value relative to the one subjected to direct capitalist value extraction is critical, and this constitutes the colonialist feature of capital. However, late capitalism, has found systematic ways to become less dependent on commodified labor through new modes of fetish value production, by relatively or fully externalizing productive labor into the artificially manufactured realms of the so-called nature, politics, and community. These peripheral or semi-peripheral realms supply the so-called free gifts necessary for the sustenance of capital. Capital has always had an innate tendency to prefer an uncommodified yet reified form of labor that can be brought under colonialist control over fully commodified labor since it does not have to pay for it. We may call this the self-purification of capital through which alienated labor, like alienated nature, to the extent possible, is thrown out of the inner organization of capital. Direct exploitation of labor is progressively being replaced with its annexation and colonization wherever possible. The labor that is excluded from being exploited directly through the secondary abstraction process within the inner organization of productive capital remains primarily abstracted and thereby continues to be the source of fetish value, as with nature and effective work. The labor that remains commodified due to the lack of technological capacity or its unautomatable nature must be exhausted to the maximum possible level and deprived of physical and mental security to be kept submissive. After all, the portion of wage labor, surplus labor, that is the source of surplus capitalist value is unpaid and thus an uncommodified, yet reified and appropriated, portion of labor power. The commodification and exploitation of labor power is the condition of possibility for the appropriation of its unwaged portion. This portion is treated like a gift from human nature and is not essentially different from unwaged reproductive labor, except that it is directly recruited in commodity production relations. Automation relocates labor power from exploitative commodity production relations to the peripheral realm of capital's colonial relations. However, the relationship between exploitation and expropriation is more than a functional one in which one side mechanistically assists the other side. The existential engagement of exploitation and expropriation is rooted in a deeper commensuration in for process. The only reason this complementary relationship is possible is that it is rooted in a deeper infra process of decommunization out of which, using Fraser's taxonomy, labor, and, the subaltern, nature, care, and modern politics are born as the abstracted and controlled forms of the sources of creativity, livability, conviviality, and alterity, respectively. The true liberation of each one of these four elements is dependent on the liberation of the rest, only, through reinstating their, partly original, partly futuristic, communist state of being. Sectors of the economy that remain outside of the direct influence of capital's inner exploitative apparatus, such as the public sector and even the big not-for-profit organizations, are progressively decommunized through corporatization from within. Despite being publicly owned and not being determined by exchange value, laborers in these sectors, including civil servants in various fields such as health care, education, and academia, 
are often required to work well above the level necessary for their social reproduction. This is due to the execution of corporate plans, rather than cooperative ones, set by a powerful and ruthless managerial class with algorithm-powered management systems. These managers are often contracted on salaries comparable to those of corporate and finance sector CEOs. The predatory managerial classes in these sectors mainly consist of individuals who have either transitioned from the corporate sector or perceive their positions as stepping stones to attain high-level executive roles in corporations. Their task is to maximize revenue through the maximum corporatization of these institutions. A significant portion of the extracted surplus is subsequently transferred to rentier and finance capital holders in exchange for various resources and services, including energy, finance, credit, land, equipment, digital platforms, construction, maintenance, security, consulting, business partnerships, and funding for joint community industry projects. This is done in the ultimate interest of the corporate sector through contracts and subcontracts. The managerial class in the public sector functions as a proxy of finance and rentier capital in the colonization of the public sector's reproductive relations, as well as in the indirect exploitation of their workers. Here, the role that the public sector plays as another subaltern sphere is more than the provision of the background conditions for the exploitation of labor in the private sector. The sector is decommonized, so the fetish value is extracted in parallel and even in greater amounts relative to the direct extraction of value from productive labor. However, none of this is possible without decommonizing the productive, creative power of the value producers and their organizational settings in such sectors. Due to the loss of the commoning type of horizontal and participatory governance, which defines value and determines the purpose as the final cause, capital, without being directly involved in non-capitalized and under-commodified realms of laboring, continues to profit. In this way, capital can achieve a higher rate of growth in money form than when it had to invest directly in variable capital, employment of labor power, and thus, would constantly be involved in class struggles. The contradiction here is that the more the labor is underwaged, underemployed, deskilled, casualized, overworked, and or precariatized under corporate settings, the more the capacity of society to take part in the circulation of capital diminishes. It has thus become more imperative for capital to colonize the subaltern life worlds to extract value. As these life worlds become scarcer, capital moves toward discovering and decommonizing less tangible, visible commons, like the future in the case of reifying risk into speculative investments, and manufacturing artificial or pseudo-commons, like social media platforms or crypto assets, for the extraction of more value. The more the communal bonds and convivial sources of true value-making are dismantled, decommonized, the more the individuals are atomized, and thus the more they seek conviviality through the monopolized artificial, virtual spaces of social liaison. The rising urge for conviviality, originally suppressed by capital in real life by alienating individuals from their commoning sources of true value, is now a new opportunity for capital. The urge is an emergent demand to be met with the supply of virtual spaces for the creation of artificial commons by online prosumers who contribute to the life of commons through their communicative actions. The high tech private digital platforms function like feudal serfdoms, in which the digital serfs become increasingly involved in the production of commodity information in exchange for being allowed to socialize on these virtual lands and to satisfy their needs for convivial relationships and communication. A better analogy can be drawn with colonization. The data produced through these relationships are seen as sources of raw materials by high-tech capital. Individuals are dispossessed of the data they generate, see Thatcher et al., 2016. The product is produced through pseudo-commoning relationships. The pre-vate exchange of products derived from digital surf doms does not determine or abstract the labor of the digital serfs. However, this does not imply that capitalism off serfdom or feudalism, as the dominance of capital continues to perpetuate feudalistic relationships alongside patriarchal and racial ones. Throughout history, capitalism has exhibited feudalistic characteristics, 
which have become more prevalent and a par end to residents of the global north following a brief period of working class embourgeoisement. More particularly in the so-called developed world, substantial sections of population have become increasingly dependent on virtual space property under the ownership and control of high-tech capital to run their businesses and organize their financial life. They form a new class of workers who, instead of selling their labor power, sell the products of their labor. The boundaries between the value makers and value takers become more and more obscure, and doubly free labor is less and less applicable to the workers. A large portion of their revenue is taken by the rentier and finance capital associated with platform capitalism. Class solidarity and class consciousness can hardly be found among this group of workers. Instead, by absorbing and being absorbed into capital as a mode of being, capitality, they are potentially the most suitable prey for the power-hungry right-wing populist elite. See Hosseini et al. 2022. Endnotes on Chapter 5. 1. This chapter reproduces the preprint paper titled Labor Redefined by Hosseini, 2022 b. 2. The use of work here should not be confused with waged work used in the post work or anti work literature with negative connotation weeks 2011 3 as noted by de angelis 2022 4 the idea has already been praised by the economist embraced by the world bank in producing its research outputs and incorporated into the real state discourse see federici 2019 page 85 5 Unfortunately, the voices with an upper hand in the commons movements, especially in the global north, seem to favor such a direction. 6. Marx, influenced by Darwin, viewed living beings' organs as their technological tools and introduced the concept of tools as organs in reference to human beings. He believed that these tools were as essential to human metabolism as their organs but only when they were under the direct control and stewardship of free human consciousness. 7. In a society where the value practices of capital determine the final cause of value production and are supported by the social norms that fetishize economic growth, the value practices of remaining or regained commons lose their capacities as the antithetical to capital. 8. The fact that international institutions like the World Bank acknowledge the importance of community-based management of the commons as a way of civilizing the relentless dominance of markets is arguably telling enough. 9. Normative subjectivity, more exclusively attributable to humans, is their capacity to affect change, through constant reflexive evaluation of their living conditions and of the future that the evolving trends of change point to. However, human beings cannot be seen as the only efficient cause of value since subjectivity, that is the capacity for affecting change, is attributable to other non-human living beings. The life domain is a mesh of interacting subjectivities. 10. Hyper-reality from our point of view is a distorted version of reality, not merely a mythological or forged symbolic or discursive, ideational presentation of reality practiced among social actors, that functions to socially reproduce a dominant hierarchical power structure. 11. Marx already made a one-off theoretical attempt that can be readily applied to contemporary cases, as long as they resemble the production relations presupposed by him. 12. Marx's hidden abode is the wage-based production site where exploitation happens, behind the apparently free market-based exchange site. See Marx, 1990, page 279.